So here in the top part of the screen, you see two charges. One is positively charged. The red one is plus three coulombs, if that were possible. And the bottom one is minus three coulombs. And the little arrows that you see everywhere are the electric field calculated at different points in space. So remember that the idea of the electric field is that charges, which we call source charges, they're usually fixed someplace in space. You don't play with them, you just put them somewhere. They produce, they modify the space around those charges, right? So at every point in space, you can assign a vector electric potential, uh, sorry, electric field. At every point in space, you can assign a vector electric field. And in that uh, silly picture that I proposed to you, uh, the positive charge blows away, blows out air, so the vectors near that charge, the wind will be pointing away from that charge. And if you're close to the negative charge, you can imagine as a vacuum cleaner with a circular attachment there with holes, then the air is blowing into it, so all those vectors are pointing towards it. Right? If you were a dust particle, place somewhere here, then you will follow a trajectory close to something like this. And if your dust particle is here, then the air will be blowing it away. Alright? <coughs> now in between them, some places that are not close to here or there, somewhere for example here, we looked at the situation for the electric field along that line. We looked at that case before and we concluded that if the charges are equal in magnitude, then the electric field along this line it's pointing straight down. Remember? So in the other side is the same thing. It's pointing down because this is positive and that is negative. So one electric field is pointing uh, uh, this way and the other electric field is pointing this way. And when you add them, you get a vertical electric field, negative electric field. I'll do it here, <laughs> but just to get an idea. Uh, the the magnitude of the electric field at different points is usually drawn by making the arrow bigger or smaller, right? But a drawing where you have, you know, hundreds or thousands of those arrows, and if you try to put the arrows bigger, closer to the charges, and smaller, far away, it gets messy very quickly. So what one possibility is to code the magnitude of the electric field with color, okay? So in this plot here, white is small magnitude, and black is maximum or high, uh, big magnitude of the vector. And the colors in between are blue, green, and red. So it goes from white, blue, green, red, black. You're going up in strength of the, of the uh, vector magnitude, okay? <coughs> so you see, for example, that the electric field is stronger in between the two charges. You see a lot of black here, closer to the charges, of course, and also in between them. And if you're far away, of course, the electric field is small, so that's why it's white. Force, when you put a particle there in that electric field. Okay, the next thing that we want to do is find an expression for the electric field, say, along the x-axis. For a dipole, which means that you have a positively charged particle and a negatively charged particle. And I'm going to try to find what is the electric field here at some point along the x-axis. So that point is going to be a distance x from the center of the charges. And the length or the distance between the two charges, I'm going to call that d. So what's the electric field uh, here? So we know that the electric field produced by the positive charge will point away from it. And we know that the electric field of the negative charge is going to point towards it. <coughs> draw these lines that connect the charges with the point. So what's the electric field, the net electric field, as we said before, and as you saw in the, uh, before, in the top part of the screen, the electric field is the sum of those two. But how does that electric field depend on your position along the x-axis? What's the mathematical expression that tells you 
that, how much it is. We know already that it's going to be negative and vertical and negative, but how much? So let's call this the electric field produced by the positive charge, and let's call this the electric field produced by the negative charge. We have to add those two electric fields to get the resulting electric field. That's what we're uh, going after. So the electric field due to the positive charge, uh, positive, has a magnitude. I want to talk about the magnitude. I know already the direction. I did my little sketch there. So the electric field of the positive charge at the location indicated by the red point is the magnitude is K times the value of the charge, Q, divided by the distance. What's the distance between the positive charge and the red point? Divided by the distance square, of course. So that's, let me call it R plus, and that will be squared. So what's R plus? <coughs> <clears throat> it's the length of the diagonal, right? So we're talking about this distance, R plus. So that's a right angle triangle. So of course, that is one side square plus the other side square. So that's X square plus D over two square. Correct? <coughs> the magnitude of the negative electric field is going to be the same because the magnitude of the charges is the same and the distance, R minus, if you want to call it, is the same as R plus. We're moving along the line that bisects the two charges. Okay? So the magnitude of E minus is the same. Now to find the electric field, the net electric field, I need to add component by component. Now I'm going to put an arrow here to remind you that this is a vector that has components. So what is the X component of the net electric field? Let's talk about this angle theta. Let's define this angle as theta, which is the same as this angle over here, which is the same as the angle below because this whole thing is very symmetric. So in terms of theta, what is the uh, X component of E? Well, the X component, one is positive, the other one's negative, so that's not hard to calculate, that's zero. The Y component might be more interesting. <coughs> the Y component of E is gonna be what? I know it's gonna be negative. It's gonna have a factor of two Right? Because the X component of E plus is the same, uh, sorry, the Y component of E plus is the same as the Y component of E minus. So what is the Y component of E plus? It's E, the magnitude that I calculated here, multiplied by what? Sine of theta, right? So E sine theta is the Y component of E plus, let's say, and I put a factor of two here because E minus has the same Y component. And the minus is because I know that they're pointing down. Correct? So, <clears throat> so the electric field, it's gonna be minus factor of two K, Q, I'm writing E now, K, Q over X squared plus D over two squared. That's what I just wrote is E. Now multiply by the sine of theta. What's the sine of theta? Sine of theta is opposite divided by hypotenuse, right? So the opposite is what? D over two. So D divided by two, that's the opposite, divided by the adjacent. Um, not the adjacent, sorry, the uh, hypotenuse, which is what I'm calling R. So that will be the square root of X squared plus 
d over 2 squared. I think I got everything there. E is there. This is E. This is the sine of theta. A factor of 2 and the minus. And I'm going to put, since this is a vector, I'm going to put in the j direction. The x component is 0, right? OK, so we can write this a little uh, more compactly, like this. Minus 2 and the 1 over 2 cancel, so you have k. QD on top divided by x squared plus d squared over 4, and that goes to the 3 over 2 power. Am I right? Yeah. 1 plus a half, 3 halves, right? And that goes in the j hat direction. <coughs> So that's the electric field. There is um, a quantity called the dipole moment, which whenever you have two charges, one positive, one negative, the distance between them is d. So you call this quantity p. You call it q times d. And you put it, you call that a vector quantity, because the direction is going to be from positive to negative. So how do I determine that? So r from r hat from the negative to the positive particle. So if you have a positive charge here and a negative charge here, and one is q and the other one's minus q, and the distance between them is d, you talk about the dipole moment as being a vector that points from negative to positive, and the magnitude of p is Q times D. All right, so that's just uh, to know the, uh, the the name given to this dipole moment. So in terms of the dipole moment, I can write this as the electric field at a position x in the x-axis is the dipole moment. You still have the sign there, a minus sign. K, I shouldn't get rid of K. And this is x squared plus d squared over 4 and to the 3 halves. Now here comes something that uh, is going to be done over and over in the chapter that we're talking about, electric field chapter, which is approximation. We want to look at, not keep expressions as complicated as this one, but maybe look in the limit when something is much bigger than something, what kind of easier expression we can have. You also want to see, uh, see whether your expression makes sense if you recover results that you know already. So, if you are very far away from the center of the charges. So what I'm saying, when I say that, what I'm saying is that x is much bigger than d, the distance between the charges. So you have a dipole, positive and negative in this in these fingers, and you're measuring the electric field far away, say on that wall over there, right? How uh, can I write an easier expression for the electric field? How does it depend on how far I am from the two charges, from the dipole, right? So if x is much bigger than d, it might be useful to pull out an x out of this uh, factor there and see what I have and approximate what I have left. So this is minus k times p, and I'm going to factor out, this is still to the 3 halves power, but I'm going to take an x squared factor of 1 plus d squared over 4x squared. Okay, so far I haven't approximated anything, I just rewrote it in a different way. So this is minus kp divided by x squared to the 3 halves is x to the third power. What's left inside the parentheses is 1 plus d squared over 4x squared to the 3 halves. Now if x is much bigger than d, then d squared over 4x squared is what? Say that x is a million times bigger than d. 
So d squared, one over one, uh, one over four million, square that, that gives you something that is 10 to the minus 12, right? So you can approximate this expression by saying that if this is true, if x is much bigger than d, then the electric field can be written. That means that the electric field on the x-axis far away from the dipole can be written as minus k p divided by, uh, I'm going to call it r. So if you're a distance r from the dipole, this is how it would change. The electric field will decay as the distance to the dipole to the third power. Okay? So that is an approximation, of course. If you're really close to the dipole, this is not going to work very well. If you go back to the original expression, which is over here, the one that has no approximation in it, <coughs> it could tell you, for example, what's the electric field between the two charges? That would be when x is equal to zero, right? You replace that and you will get something as a function of uh, d to the third power. The book has a discussion about this, the electric field of a dipole, positive charge, negative charge, but along this line, the line that connects the two charges, okay? So that requires also an approximation. It's slightly more complicated what I, than what I just did here, but the result is similar in the sense that the electric field away from a dipole in the direction that connects the two charges also decays as one over r to the third power. Okay, so think about how does the electric field decay away from a point charge? It goes as 1 over r squared, right? Now the electric field coming away uh, from or uh, generated by two charges opposite signs decays faster than that. Decays like r to the third power. 